Welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling. Today I'm going to talk about how the Fed creates money. And I'm, I'm going to give the textbook story of how the Fed creates money. Um, the true story is a bit more subtle. It involves something called repurchase agreements. Uh, there's a book by Marcia Stigham, and I think over the years there have been additional co-authors. Co but it's some, called something like the money market or simply Stigham's money market. And if you're really interested in the details of uh, how the sort of in, inner workings of the financial system, I recommend that. So I'm going to give you the textbook story. And we'll start that story with a, a stylized balance sheet of a private bank. So. I'm going to distinguish a private bank from the Fed, which is a government or central bank. So a private bank, and it's going to have assets and liabilities. Okay, and the assets are going to be loans, so it's <coughs> lent money to, let's say, a real estate developer or a, um, um, a grocery store for inventory or something like that. So it's lent money, it's being owed money, and those are assets. Uh, <coughs> it also has reserves. And then its liabilities are its uh, deposit accounts. We'll just assume that this bank only has checking accounts. So checking account deposits. So deposits in checking accounts. And uh, it also has, um, we, we stick, we often will draw a line here and we'll say that it has some net worth. Uh, so that'll be what the bank has. But we're going to focus on the loans, the reserves, and <coughs> the checking account deposits. Uh, we're going to focus on those parts of the balance sheet. So let's uh, let's put some numbers in there. Let's uh, so let's say we have our assets, our liabilities. And suppose it has, well, we'll do a nice small number, $1,000 worth of loans and <coughs> we'll suppose $100 worth of reserves and uh, so the and we'll balance that with 1,100 of deposits. Okay, and suppose that the reserve requirement is 1 to 11. Suppose that re reserves have to be in a certain ratio relative to deposits. So the ratio of reserves to deposits, deposits, has to be greater than or equal to 1 out of 11. So right now it's just meeting the reserve requirement. Um, <coughs> and suppose somebody walks into this bank and deposits another $100. So now we ha it has 1,200 in deposits a thousand in reserve, a thousand in loans, and one hundred in reserves. Well, now it has more reserves than it needs. It could lend out um, one eleventh of that additional hundred dollars in deposits, and so it could lend out, <coughs> let's say, um, what would that be? About eighty-nine. Uh, it could let's let's say lend out eighty-nine dollars. And so then the balance sheet would have uh, 
1200 <coughs> and uh, what would it have in terms of reserves left over? It would have 111 in reserves. So that would be um, um, that that would be meeting the reserve requirement and now it's it's expanded loans and now whoever received those loans the extra eighty nine dollars in loans might deposit it in another bank and then that bank could then expand its lending because it would now have more money that needs to meet its reserve requirements and that process of expanding lending as banks get more money is called the money multiplier. So as banks get more deposits, <coughs> they can uh, they can lend more. Okay, but what the Federal Reserve tries to control, so now I'm going to put, so let's put, keep the bank's balance sheet, remember this is the private bank, and we're going to focus on loans, reserves, which is just money it's not lending out, and deposits. And now we're going to put the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. <coughs> and the Fed's assets, on the asset side, this is the liability side, the assets um, are typically treasury securities, Again, these traditionally were in the form of repurchase agreements, but we'll ignore that. So treasury securities, its liabilities are bank reserves, and I'll include currency. But currency could be used, if the currency were held in a bank, it would, be, it would be included in bank reserves. So currency of the public. And I'm going to actually ignore the currency of the public for now. I'm going to focus on <coughs> its liabilities are bank reserves. So what the Fed can do is just as a pure exercise in it, almost a pure exercise in accounting, it, it can go to a, this private bank and let's say I would like to buy some treasury securities that you own. So now I guess we'd have to pretend that, that it had some treasury securities as assets. And I will give you <coughs> in exchange with at the stroke of a pen or with a uh, uh, movement on a computer, an, an accounting movement on a computer, I'm going to give you more reserves. I'm going to say that you hold more reserves at the Fed. So I'm going to give you $10, let's say, worth of reserves and, um, <coughs> and buy $10 worth of treasury securities with that. Now the bank has more in reserves and so it can make more loans and take more deposits so it can expand its money supply. So if its reserve requirement were, let's say, one-tenth, so if the ratio of deposits to reserves um, is 10 to 1, well, I hope I did that correctly up here, didn't, yeah, I did reserves deposits is 1 tenth, or deposits to reserves is 10 to 1, then that $10 of reserves could allow the bank to make an additional <coughs> $90 worth of loans, and a hundred dollars worth of deposits so these are all in increments, an increment of ten dollars reserves, an increment of ninety dollars of loans, an increment of hundred dollars of deposits and so in that process the Fed has increased the amount of money outstanding, the supply of money. Now maybe I should back up and define various types of money, measures of money. There's something called M0 or H 
H stands for high powered money <coughs> and that's equal to currency of the public plus reserves and that's what the Federal Reserve can, can absolutely control these numbers although there, there are some issues there for instance currency held by the public some of it uh, ends up overseas some of it ends up used in the underground economy where you know people the Fed doesn't really keep track of it uh, terribly well so uh, but issues of that aside the Fed can control the total of currency in the public and bank reserves the M1 money supply is equal to currency held by the public plus deposits in checking accounts. And then <coughs> the M2 money supply is cur is M1 that is everything that's in M1 plus deposits in savings accounts and the idea of counting that is that people can pretty easily move money from savings accounts into checking accounts but this raises all sorts of questions about what really constitutes money um, you know what the the idea behind <coughs> I think the this definition it's pretty clear that the Fed absolutely controls it but the relationship between money this and M1 depends on the behavior of banks and we'll talk about that next time a little bit and the relationship between this and this depends on how people split up their funds between savings accounts and checking accounts and uh, some economists don't want that arbitrary split to matter so then they focus on M2 but then people's use of M1 and M2 depends on things like money market funds whether they're using those a lot or not depends on how they use credit cards and debit cards so you can get into all sorts of controversies about what is the right measure of the money supply, the one that corresponds to the theoretical thing where we ask about is the money neutral, to how does it affect aggregate demand, uh, <coughs> so all those issues can come out. But I want to leave those aside. I want to instead uh, focus on one simple thing about this money multiplier concept that if the reserve requirement so if let's say the reserve requirement equals let's call it RR or in an example uh, it were 0.10 <laughs> that would mean that the ratio of reserves to deposits equals 0 0.10 in this example. And, and this is part of the if assumption, and there are no excess reserves. then the money multiple then the change in M1 over the change in reserves is equal to 1 over RR or in this example 1 over 0.1 equals 10 so the, the Fed would get like a 10 for 1 bang for every one dollar of reserves reserves sorry about that one dollar reserves <coughs> would yield ten dollars more of um, M1 money well you know what there's another assumption we have to make 
no excess reserves and no leakage into currency because if people hold some of the new money as currency then it doesn't stay in the banking system and so it doesn't produce this money multiplier so these two assumptions we are what we need for the money multiplier to be one over the reserve requirement and one is that there be no excess reserves at the bank there's no leakage from banks holding excess reserves and there's no leakage from the public holding currency and I think I'll talk about, end here and next time talk about the traditional three tools of monetary policy.